Hey, are you here? Hmm, let me try that again. Are you here? <laughs> yes, you're here. You've been here all along. And we welcome you to another episode of your Paul Leslie Hour. And boy, do we have a great interview for you today. Paul is joined by a man who has made his mark in radio, record producing, and rodeo. Eddie Kilroy is here. He's known in the radio world for spinning the country platters. He's known for his work with Willie's Place on Sirius XM, which he has since retired from. And in the record business, he's been a producer. Some greats. He produced Mickey Gilly and Marty Robbins, as well as the legendary Jerry Lee Lewis. Hey, can you help the Paul Leslie Hour? Yep, it's easy. You just go to www.thepaulleslie.com slash support, and we thank you. And now, Eddie Kilroy awaits you, a great American and a fantastic interview subject, only on The Paul Leslie Hour. Hello, this is Kilroy. Hey, Mr. Kilroy, this is Paul Leslie. How are you? Fine, Paul. How are you this morning? I'm doing good. Glad to connect with you. It's my pleasure. Are you in upstate New York or in the city? <laughs> uh, that number I've had for a long time, but it's all small oh. years. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Mine came from Texas. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. Uh, I'm right off the coast of uh, of South Carolina right now. Oh, that's beautiful there. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm loving it. Well, I'm. I'm deep, uh, right smack dab in the middle of Oklahoma. In Oklahoma and surrounded by horses, right? Yeah, yeah, not as many as we had at the ranch. We sold our ranch down in Texas to move here for a business deal. And, uh, gosh, we've been here seven years. But soon, probably back to Texas. Back to Texas. So anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, when we bought here, we only uh, brought up... Uh, we kind of cream the crop of our horses. We only brought four up here. But uh, they're like taking care of children, you know. Tell me a little about your show so I can talk intelligently, if I had any intelligence left. <laughs> well, it's been uh, it's been going on now. It's uh, been 18 years. I talk to a lot of songwriters, and I, I yeah. love talking to record producers. I basically talk to people about their lives, about their perspectives. Oh, okay. Good. Well, I know the people enjoy your show, I'm sure. I hope so. And the content, of course. Well, sure. <laughs> sure. So I want to introduce everybody to Eddie Kilroy. He is a man who's worn a lot of hats. Everything from record producer to uh, radio personality would be another one. These days, it's the horse business. Uh, yeah. What, yeah. what am I leaving out? No, interestingly enough, and I happened to think of that the other day, that in my, um, uh, even in my formative youth, I only had uh, three professions, and they all started with an R. That was first rodeo, and the second, of course, radio, and, uh, and the record business. So everything I've done has an R. I'm looking <laughs> for another R that I can be successful at. Interesting. The R's. So the first the first love you had it was the rodeo right? Yeah, uh, always being from Texas and small town ranch town down there, everybody had a guitar and everybody knew three cards and everybody wrote songs. So um, I had a, created an interest in uh, in music right away. And my mother taught piano and voice, so I was always exposed to it. And uh, then of course it comes a time when you're rodeoing. There was that that particular era. The guys now and and the gals are making decent livings rodeoing. But back in those early days, there was no money. You know, you always had to have that day job. And um, being attracted to music, I decided to uh, to take that route. And I kind of laid uh, rodeo aside for a long time, and then went back to it. So, and stayed in radio. And um, Gosh, I've just been blessed uh, with, with such a wonderful life and the opportunity to know and work with so many talented and, and wonderful people, you know. So I was, I feel blessed. 
is rodeo something that is you think is understood by the the general public? I think so now because for the first time in the last ten years, fifteen years, it's been getting a lot of television exposure, and uh, people uh, are understanding it more. And especially uh, the hottest thing going besides rodeo is uh, PBR, the professional bull riders, because it's easy for the uh, People that aren't acquainted or have knowledge of rodeo or bull riding or something, it's pretty simple to understand. And the bulls are bad, cowboys are great, and the they want to stay eight seconds on a bull. So that's not hard to understand. So the PBR, the professional bull riders, has grown leaps and bounds, you know, where they can, you know, your top guys are making a million to two million a year. And had that been in my day, I wouldn't have quit it. But I never <laughs> rode bulls. I was I was too large. Bull riders are regular people, regular size, normal size people. You know, actually the the perfect height for any rough stock rider, whether it's box or bulls or, or whatever, it would probably be anywhere from five eight to five ten, hundred and fifty, hundred fifty five, hundred sixty pounds. And uh, it, I think that people see those guys that are not huge in statue competing against a 2,000 pound bull. So that's grown very, very big, you know, but in, in my day it was a rodeo and that was before the professional bull riders. So and rodeo is still there. One thing I, rodeo got a bad rap on the mistreatment of animals. Right. Uh, we, we had problems with PETA. I know they used to go to rodeos. After I quit being a contestant years later, I was talked into coming back as a pro rodeo announcer. And the hardest thing to do was explain to the people that we're not being cruel to these animals. To the contrary, the owners of the bulls and the bucking horses treat them. Kids would like to be treated that well. I mean, they live and breathe their animals. They protect them. They feed them. They take care of them. And they work eight seconds a night. And so they're well taken care of. There's no cruelty. And... It's just something that's grown up, but uh, the music industry will always, always be my first love because having a, uh, a love for music, it was uh, something that just came natural, you know, and being exposed to it. And having the opportunity to work with such great entertainers and produce great people, not only by talent, but, uh, you know, most of the people in country music in that era can't speak for today because it's all changed, and I don't know a lot of these people. But in my era, everybody came from the country. So they most retained their country values and their country way of life. And they just um, did something different for a living. You know, a, a guy drives a truck for a living. These people entertain for a living. And, but it was still a job. But it was a job they loved, of course. But it's, a, it's an amazing world we live in today. Music has evolved. And um, quite honestly, it's evolved where I don't understand it now. <laughs> so, but that's okay. A lot of people do, and they sell a lot of records. But I enjoyed my stay at, uh, at radio also, which was a kind of a strange deal, Paul, that um, how I ever ended up at XM Radio. Uh, I was um, doing quite well and blessed in, uh, in music in Nashville. And then the music changed. And I'm being very honest with you. And I really didn't understand it. And a producer really needs to have some clue, at least, of what to do in there. And I called a friend of mine that had worked for me for years when I was uh, president of Playboy Records for Hefner. And he was my West Coast promotion guy and became a really good friend. And he ended up at um, MCA Records. His name was Bruce Hinton. And I called Bruce and I said, Bruce. I don't understand the music. I'm leaving town. My uh, roping horse is on his game. I'm going to my place in Bandera, Texas, and I'm just going to rope. And if somebody needs me to uh, produce a record, they call me. And he said, oh, you can't go there. You can't do this. I said, why? He said, there's somebody in Washington, D.C. really needs you. Well, G.W. Bush had just gone into office, and I knew absolutely it was not him. And I said, who needs me in Washington? He said, Nobody knows about it, but it's going to be huge, called XM Satellite Radio. And I said, Bruce, I haven't worked in radio in 30 years. He said, they want you for your knowledge of country music, and and they don't want real people that do the, hi, I'm a radio guy, you know. (laughs) They want to 
they want to speak to to the audience on on their level, you know. And also, XM was very interesting how they put it together. But first of all, let me back up. I was a little bit. I said, oh yeah, 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 XM Radio, you know, big deal. They weren't on the air yet, and uh, so they called and wanted me to uh, come to Washington. And I went on up to meet with them. And when I walked into XM Satellite Radio's plant, oh my God, I was just overwhelmed because I was kind of jaded, uh, quite honestly, because I had produced records in most of the centers in Europe and every center here in America. And, you know, what, what am I going to see there? And I walked in, I said, oh my God, 82 digital studios under one roof operations, um, broadcast operations center was exactly looking like Star Wars with the commander chairs, monitoring the satellite. We only had one up at the time. I went there six months before we went on the air to do the architecture. Home. And uh, it turned out to be a great ride and a, a lot of fun. And eventually they, with the help of Willie Nelson, uh, we persuaded them to build a studio for me in Texas. And that's when Elizabeth and I could buy the ranch and uh, get back home to Texas, which I'm a native Texan. And and that was quite a ride because uh, the first studio they built there was in our ranch house, which was a nice home, of course, and converted one of the bedrooms into a studio. So, And I was still program director, but it, I could do my show from there. And I'd go on at 6, uh, I'm off there at 10, 10, 15, I'm at the barn with the horses. Life doesn't get any better, you know. <laughs> so, And then along came Sirius, and they bought my contract out. They said, well, you're great, you know, and da-da-da-da-da, uh, you know, the whole deal. You know, suits talk. Right. But you're making, you're making too much money. And I said, I didn't think I was making it up. <laughs> so anyway, to make a long story short, and I say this, please don't take this as being braggadocious, but this is something that speaks well for, for traditional country. They had 68 music channels. The only channel that had higher ratings than my channel was Fox News. And But out of the 68 music channels, my channel was the number one channel by far. And it was all because people could not get that country music anywhere else. And it was, I would say that when we first put it up and launched the satellites, the first year, probably 60 to 70 percent of the audience were uh, truck drivers because it was a godsend for them. They could put it on uh, XM radio and go anywhere in the world and hear it, you know, anywhere in the continental United States and Canada. And so that they immediately gravitated to it, and then it built and it built uh, through the years. And sometimes I'm, uh, I've got an old uh, in-house rating, and I'm amazed that we were rated so high with the with the listeners, you know, just by playing. And it was not necessarily me, of course, or my afternoon guy or any of the guys that were working for me. It was the fact that people could not get Ray Price and people like that uh, anywhere. So they just came there. So the music uh, that we built that channel around is really what made it. You know, and The channel didn't have a lot of personality, but it was, a, it was a fun ride in 1909. After Sirius bought it, I asked Willie, he was at the house. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do now, Willie. And he said, hell, Kilroy, start a, uh, do a TV show. <laughs> oh, okay, we'll do a TV show. Well, that's easy to say. And then uh, because I had not done one, I'd been guest on a lot of them and, and visited with them. But uh, we did the TV show and for Great American Country. And then it was really a pretty good show. They said it was the best show that it had come in in years. But um, the hats and the suits in New York didn't think they could sell traditional country music because it built around it. So we just had that one thing, and that kind of that kind of ended that. But it was a it was a wonderful ride. I've had a great life, you know. The I've got a story that's really interesting to me, and it may not be to you, but I I reflect on it often. When I was ten years old. My mother and I were driving from the ranch uh, to another little town, and my mother was into music. I mentioned she was a, a voice teacher and a piano teacher, 
and the radio was on, and we got one radio station in Liberty, Texas, my hometown. It came out of Houston, and it was country, and we were listening to it, and this guy comes on with this incredible voice. I mean, I just said, wow, and I turned the radio up. I said, mother, listen to this, uh, listen to this guy sing. And Beth Colley was the, was the, uh, what they called disc jockeys then. And, um, he came on and said, that's Marty Robbins, the boy with the tear in his voice. And oh God, and I said, oh my God, what a great singer. I was 10 years old. Who would think years later that I'd be producing Marty Robbins in mm-hmm. Nashville? Yeah. And to take it even further, now the name of that song was his first record called I'll Go On Alone. And Marty and I were sitting around uh, picking songs and going over songs for the new album. And I said, Marty, have you ever thought about recording an old song that you had recorded before? He said, what were you thinking of? I said, your first record, I'll Go On Alone. And I said, he said, wow, man, I've always wanted to record that. So we did it, and it still was not really clicking in my mind, uh, hearing him on the radio and, and so forth and so on. But as we were recording that song, I said, oh, my God, who would think that I would be producing Marty Robbins on the song? That was his first record. And I thought, that was a God deal, you know? <laughs> everything ever, ever, everything ever good happened to me. I was, I said, oh, well, that was a God deal. He wanted it to happen, and it happened. I never thought I made it happen, you know. But uh, I've had a lot of God deals in my life, and that's a blessing. Um, somebody said the other day that I was in the fourth quarter of my life. I said, yeah, but two minutes to play, we better throw a Hail Mary. <laughs> 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 but uh, nevertheless, um, any questions you have that... Uh, that I can answer for you. There's somebody that might want to know something of interest. Just ask me. I'll shoot you right with you. All right. Well, I'm definitely enjoying what you have to say. First of all, we have to acknowledge what a great speaking voice that God gave you. Uh, well, I thank you so much. It was, you know, I went to, um, I hired a guy to do afternoons by the name of Gary Hightower. And we all had different deals and nicknaming catfish, you know. And uh, he did afternoons on XM for me. And I was uh, like in my 50s when I went there. And Gary was probably about the same age. He said, you know, we're so lucky that we don't sound old. Now, this was like in 2001. So I'm probably sounding pretty old now. But at the time, we uh, we didn't sound like two old guys in there playing country music. So it worked out pretty good. But thank you for the compliment on the boys. It's held up through the years. Yes, sir. So tell us about the first time that you went to Music City, Nashville, Tennessee. That's an interesting story. That's a, at least I find it interesting. I was at a rodeo. I was a steer, my main event was steer wrestling, bulldogging, because uh, I was a big guy. And then I roped and did well. But my passion was riding saddle broncs, riding bucking horses. But because I was pretty tall, as I was mentioned to you, that I was way beyond the perfect size for what we call rough stock, which would mean uh, bareback broncs, saddle broncs, and uh, bulls. But I loved riding bucking horses. And somebody said, and I was not good at it, by the way. And somebody said, why are you why are you bulldogging so much? I said, that supports my bronc riding habits because I never went a dime. But uh, I was at a rodeo to make shorten the story in Arkansas, and I had two horses in a trailer behind a half ton pickup. And I looked at the atlas, and from where I was at Arkansas, Nashville was only one inch away on the atlas, and turned out to be 240 miles, but it looked like about an inch. So I said, you know, I'll go to Nashville and just show them some of the songs I'd written. And I went to the only people I knew the name of that was active uh, in recording or anything was Chet Atkins. So I went over to Chet's office and I said, I'd like to see Chet Atkins. And the, the girl said, um, his receptionist, well, you didn't have an appointment, did you? I said, no, ma'am, I didn't. I was uh, maybe 19 years old. And Chet's busy right now. And I said, well, 
I've got two horses out in, in your parking lot and trailer, and it's very, very hot, so I won't be able to wait around, but thanks very much. And as I'm driving out, it was on 17th Avenue, and I went on 16th Avenue, and I saw this old house with sign up said Farron Young Enterprises. Well, Farron at that time was huge. Nobody knows his name now. Very few people do unless you're a person of age, but Farron was a superstar. And I said, well, why not? So I just pulled in and uh, went in. So I said, I'd like to see Farron Young, ma'am. And she said, uh, what do you want to see? What do you need to see him for? And I said, I want to show him some songs. So she left the room and lo and behold, there's Farron Young. And oh my God. I said, man, I'm looking at Farron Young because I really, really was kind of infatuated with his singing also. And he was a superstar. And I said, God, I can't believe I'm looking at him. And he said, boy, you got some songs. I said, he talked a little bit rough, you know, he said, just Farron's way. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, get your butt in here and sing them to me. So I did, and at uh, three or four of them, I can't remember it, but I know his response was, boy, those ain't worth a S-H-I-T. <laughs> uh, I said, oh, really? I said, well, they were pretty good in Liberty, Texas. And he said, but you need to move up here, and every time you write a song, you bring it to me. And so I thought, oh, yeah, well, was a wasted uh, trip to Nashville, and I went on back to Texas. The more I thought about it, I said, I'm going to try it. So I went to Nashville, and when I got there, I had $40. And I didn't know anybody but just that slight meeting with Farron. But somehow or another, things worked out, and I be was able to get into the industry. And Farron was always, uh, to me, we began, ended up becoming good friends. He ended up recording songs <laughs> like he said he would. So I took him enough. And um, he was uh, uh, kind of my mentor, and more than that, he was my uh, my. He you know, was always encouraging, and he was kind of uh, gave me motivation to keep on, you know. Because after you have songs turned out, and, and then I decided to start producing records, and I had the opportunity to learn through osmosis. And after a couple of years. People would let me kind of hang out at the studio, like uh, Owen Bradley was recording, Pat, not Patsy, but somebody, because Patsy died shortly after I got there. And uh, I just kind of learned producing through osmosis, just hanging out, watching people and so forth, you know. And then it was very hard to get into that because there were no independent producers in those days. You either worked for a company, you know, like Chet recorded everything for RCA, Owen Bradley did everything for DECA, Steve Scholes did everything for Columbia. And I said, how in the world am I going to get to be a producer because of what I really wanted to do? So because of old radio contacts and people I'd made friends with, I got into record promotion. And I did that for a long time, maybe five or six years. I finally got the opportunity to work with Jerry Lee Lewis and Mercury and I put him country in 1968 when his career was pretty much in the pits you know but I knew that he could do country music really great called another place another time oh yeah and it was it was a big hit and kind of put Jerry country and then I had a battle in, with uh, Mercury Records and I left there went on my own and uh, well actually no I left there and I went to work with Jerry. That's right. Uh, and I ran his uh, publishing management and kind of managed him for about a year and a half. And after that, I moved back to, uh, to Nashville. This was in Memphis. And I opened my own offices and didn't know that we were in a, that we were in a recession because I'd been living in a recession all my life. So I never even noticed it. And that gave me the opportunity to produce independently. And I started picking up some things and I had a call. This is really another one of those God deals. Uh, and my receptionist called and there's somebody on the phone from uh, Playboy in uh, Los Angeles. I said, well, that's weird. And I picked up the phone and I said, hi, it's Joe Roy. He said, we're looking to get into country music with a record label. And the more we check around, the more your name comes up. With you. Uh, how do you get a hit record? And that was kind of a weird answer. I said, well, 
<laughs> how, no, how do you start a, a country uh, label? I said, you find a hit record. And I didn't know what else to say. He said, well, if you find one, uh, call us. Well, along come Gilly. And uh, he said, I've got a cut of record that uh, everybody in Houston likes. And it's uh, playing real big in Dallas. And Tom Allen was program director of K-Box in Dallas. And a good friend of mine, I called Tom. I said, you play a Mickey Gilly record? He says, the hottest record we have. And I said, wow, okay. So I called Mickey, and which Gilly and I went back. Uh, he was the best man in my first wedding when I was 18. So we'd been friends forever. I said, I got you a record deal, man. He said, with who? I said, because everybody in the world had turned him down. And I spoke because he sounded too much like Jerry Lee Lewis or whatever. Because they're first cousins. They all learned to play piano together and sing together. So to make a long story short, I signed him to Playboy. And we hit uh, our first record was uh, number one in the nation, which was Room Full of Roses. And from the rest, we started stringing out a lot of number one records. So it's been, it was a, a good ride. And when Playboy sold to CBS, I went over as president of MCA Records. And then eventually I, it seems like now that I think of it and I'm telling you the story, that everything I got going, I got bought out. So, uh, XM was bought out after eight years, uh, we have bought Playboy. And I decided I'm just going to start my own uh, independent production company and give me the opportunity to produce a lot of people. And by that time, I could pick, pick, you know, you get to the point where you can pick up the phone and get anybody on the phone. So uh, I started working and I got to produce uh, because I was independent and I could work for any label. Uh, gosh, I got to do Fair and Young, which I had a lot of fun doing that, that going back to the story of my relationship with him. And I signed, uh, no, I didn't sign, uh, Louise Mandrell, Marty Robbins, oh gosh, uh, some more records on Jerry Lee Lewis, that's right, we had a big record on 39 and Holding, and I did that with Jerry when he was on Warner Brothers, Warner Electra. And Over the Rainbow, I forget, we had a few hits there. And then I continued cutting hits. Until the music changed. And uh, going back to that conversation with uh, Bruce Hinton, my friend at MCA, that suggested, uh, said that XM Radio could sure use me. And I told Bruce, I said, Bruce, I'm going to Texas Rope. I don't want to record anymore. And he laughed. He said, nobody does. Music so screwed up now. And he said, but you don't go roping down in uh, Bandera, Texas because of D.C. But anyway, that music was changing. And what made really, really made me decide to do something else was the fact that I was driving to my office. And I wish I could tell you the name of the record, but I can't. But I was aware there was a big record called This, By This, and so forth. And I hear this record on the radio. And I said, and the record was huge. Why can't I remember that? Because it was a big record. It got my attention. And... I said, you know, if that song had come into me, I wouldn't record that song, which tells me I don't belong doing this anymore. Hmm. Because the first thing a producer has to do is recognize the hit song and uh, fit it with the artist and place it in that place where it would be productive, you know. And I kind of said, you know, the music changed. This was after everybody blamed the music change on Garth, on um, Shania, and people like that. They changed the music. It really wasn't them. It was the executives that had moved in. And, and the, excuse me, let me back up. The music, that did not change the music that much, you know, because Garth was still country, but it was just a different kind of country. And they marketed him. Garth has a degree in marketing, so he knew how to market himself. But it was everything that followed him, all the other acts, you know, that uh, looked like they dressed at, uh, and I don't say this in bitterness at all, please. Uh, they look like they dress for the Salvation Army. That's where they do their shopping. <laughs> if you watch the award show, I'm saying, I don't, I don't which I don't watch anymore because it's kind of heartbreaking to see, you know, people come out that only, the audience wants to see somebody that's really exciting and makes a good presentation. I said, 
how do they like these people with the, you know, with their ragged, dirty old clothes? You know, I mean, they were wearing things at the uh, CMA or Academy of Country Music show that I work at the barn in. So I'm thinking, I, I just don't understand it anymore. I'm, I have no bitterness about it. I bet, truthfully, I'm disappointed in the direction the new country, if you can call it, that is gone because the songs are not there. They don't tell a good story. They Sometimes I can't even understand what they're saying. So, and you, I know I sound like a bitter old record producer, but I'm just being honest with you. And I, any, uh, anything that's happening, having, the only thing I'm having a hard time with is the Biden administration. But most things I can accept. The music <laughs> change I accept. <laughs> well, you're not alone there. I know, I know. I wouldn't. <laughs> My wife asked. I've got a big, uh, big Chevrolet Duramax Dooley that I drive, and I'm going to take some horses up to uh, 30 miles tomorrow. And she said, "Do you want? To, are you going to use your truck?" I said, uh, "Yeah, but yeah, I'll use my truck." She said, "Well, you don't have but a quarter of a tank of fuel. I'll, uh, I'll just take it to the store and uh, fill it up." I said, "I'd be sweet, thank you, babe." And she came back and she said. I stopped at a hundred dollars, but it almost filled it up. And I'm thinking, a hundred dollars didn't fill it up. And I'm Goodness. thinking, how are people, wonderful people, older people that never really had the the job to pay in a ton of Social Security, you know? So consequently, they're trying to live on a hundred, fifteen hundred dollars a month or a thousand dollars a month. A hard price for them because those are the people that. $20 means whether they're going to pay the electric bill or not. Right. And in the economy like it is now, it really hurts me for them. Absolutely. I know we're going to talk about music. But don't get me off on uh, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm extremely conservative. Not, uh, I'm not a racist, but people have said that knew me said, good God, go worry. You make Archie Bunker look liberal. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just know that on this show you can tell me anything. I'm, I'm <laughs> not. I'm not at all. Uh, let me just say I'm. I'm proud to be an American. Uh, me too. Thank God. Yes. Yes. That's why that American flag always flies, and a big flag, not as big as the ones at the car dealership, but a large flag flies at my place all the time. Because if you cut my, I think I'd bleed red, white, and blue. <laughs> well, you were mentioning just a, a little while ago the great Jerry Lee Lewis. Wow. And yeah. I'm hoping you can tell us, what is he, when you when you get close to him, how would you describe him? What is he like? There's a couple of Jerry Lee Lewis's, Okay. Jerry and I have uh, quite a relationship because we've been friends since 1958, 57, 58, somewhere in there. And then I've produced him in several different eras. And Jerry, when he is not under the influence of something, he's uh, he's a good guy. And people think he's – when I had to – I don't know if you saw the movie about him – one of those guys, one of those brothers played Jerry Lee Lewis. Who was it? Anyway, they made him look like a buffoon, literally. And he's far from a buffoon. We traveled together many, many days, shared hotel rooms. And every day he would get to wherever, what town we were in, he would get that morning paper and he would read it front to back. He can talk to you about anything, world affairs, whatever, politics, it doesn't matter. And another thing, and I think it was a constant battle with Jerry. Uh, Jerry and Mickey and Jimmy Lee, they're all cousins. Jimmy Lee Swagger, the preacher, Mickey Gilly, and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, all cousins, all play the piano, all from this little bitty town in uh, North Louisiana called Faraday, right across the Mississippi River from Natchez, Mississippi. So Jerry... When he was drinking, and everybody knows Jerry did a lot of drugs, he was a, a different person, of course, as those, those things make you different. But I could always handle him in the studio because, you know, we were friends enough to say 
man, you didn't do that right. Let's do it again. You know, where people were afraid to tell him that other producers because of his being so volatile at times. So it's, uh, but Jerry, uh, Jerry was two Jerry's, you know, that was, uh, one otherwise. And a thing that I, I mentioned to people that questioned me about that, about that era, the guys like, uh, they got into the amphetamines, diet pills and so forth were people that came from very, very poor families, backgrounds, you know, which didn't make them bad people. They just were not. They didn't, they weren't worldly. I don't know the exact way to describe it, but then all of a sudden, and I'll use Lewis as a, he's living in, coming out of the house in Faraday, Louisiana, which tar paper was hanging over the uh, windows because they didn't have window panes. I mean, they were poor. And then all of a sudden, almost overnight, he's making $10,000 a night doing a show, which in the 50s was a ton of money. You know, it'd be like 100000 now. And they weren't educated. They didn't finish school, which is okay because you don't have to do that to have good sense. But they just all of a sudden just couldn't, they could not handle success. Johnny Cash was the same way. The only one that came out of the Sun crew out there would probably be Roy Orbison that never got into, uh, into drugs or anything. But, you know, Cash, Jerry, that bunch. I don't think Carl Perkins, uh, when he had blue suede shoes, I don't think Carl was a great guy. Now he was super, but Jerry, it's hard to explain him. He's a very intricate person. Uh, uh, he he can get boisterous. He has an ego. But the one thing about Jerry that I will say that he'll, to use an old Texas term, he'll pop off. You know, like say things, hmm. um, bragging or something. But he never made a statement that he couldn't back up. <laughs> he, you know, he'd tell somebody, son, you don't want to follow me on stage. And one time, oh, Lord, we were in, uh, I think it was North Carolina, and there was a, a venue there that was a huge, huge circus, uh, circus tent outside. And um, Tom T. Hall, who had uh, quite an ego, he said he needed to get out and go somewhere. Would the promoter mind him closing the show? I'm trying to remember all the words and it, it tell you the story exactly. And uh, Jerry said, uh, he really wants to follow me. And he said, well, yeah, he wants to close the show, Jerry. Jerry said, that's fine. That's fine. There was probably about 4,000 people under that huge tent. And Jerry came on, did his show, did the whole thing, except when he knew somebody was going to follow him, he dialed it up really high. And he went on, and they brought Tom T. Hall on, and there was maybe 50 people left. They all left. Hmm. So people that wanted to follow Jerry Lee Lewis, they were silly. You can't follow him. I mean, he just would work a crowd and uh, get them into a frenzy, whether he was doing country, rock and roll, or what, which on live shows he kind of mixed up together. Of course, he always had to do a whole lot of shaking to close. But uh, we were at the Steel Pier when I was real young. And was that in New Jersey? I can't remember. Or in New York. Anyhow, Chuck Berry was on the show. And the he was a good showman. Chuck was good. This is going back to the rock and Billy days, rock and roll. And the promoter said the only way he could cut the deal was if they alternated opening and closing. Chuck wanted to close the show. Jerry wanted to close the show. So this particular evening, still pair, uh, still pair, uh, Chuck was going to close the show and Jerry went out and did his show. And as he's leaving, he had a, a uh, the old lighter fluid you used to put in Zippo lighters. And he just poured it all over the piano and then threw a match to it. And as he was walking off stage passing Chuck, he said, follow that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody was going to upstage him. And he, he was just that way, and I never did see anybody. But also, speaking of Jerry, no one realized what a pianist he really was. How accomplished, uh, With no piano lessons, no nothing, just 
naturally born. And if any, you hear that old phrase that's been used and thrown around so much, God given talent. Right. I truly believe it was God gave him that talent because he never, it was natural. He never had a lesson or anything, but I'm getting to the point. Are you familiar with a classical pianist by the name of Van Clavering? I have heard the name. Yeah, he was like one of the top, you know, and a wonderful piano player, obviously. He made millions of dollars on classical concerts. He was came out to the house. He was a Jerry Lee Lewis fan. And he came out to the house, and Jerry had a piano there. And we were just sitting around shooting, shooting the bull, and uh, Van Clavering, like any piano player, including Lewis, they can't stay away from the piano. He sat down at Jerry's piano, and he started playing this classical thing. I mean, it was... I'm supposed to know a little about music, and I couldn't follow his card changes. I didn't know exactly what he was playing. It was just really busy and really a lot of crescendos. And uh, Jerry said, that's pretty good, son. I don't think I'll play it. And he sat down and just from hearing it one time, played it note for note, just like Van Clavering. Wow. Jerry could play classical music, rock and roll music, ragtime music, whatever he wanted, you know. But... Uh, it was funny. He, I decided to take him the last album I did on him. There's a place called Caribou Ranch in uh, Nederland, Colorado. That Jim Gershio, the guy that started a big band called a uh, group called Chicago, he built it, and it was a place, and there was houses and facilities scattered out around it. So people like Elton John, the Rolling Stones, all those people went there to record because it was way out on the ranch that was so secluded that it was 30 miles to Boulder. So there's no beer joints, no anything. You just live there. You just stay there and you record. If you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, I think I want to go cut a record, you just go in the studio and cut a record, you know, whatever time. It, in other words, you're there for two or three weeks and you just theoretically have rented the entire facility and it belongs to you. And so I said, that's the perfect place to take Jerry. I'll record him there because people can't get to him and the hangers on won't be there. And I, I brought him up there and the, to record him the next day. Here comes all the people he brought, he brought the party with him. So that was a, a hectic couple of weeks, but we got some good records out of it. <laughs> but uh, Jerry was Jerry, you know, I, I could say a lot of things about Jerry and people have after wanted me to do a book on him and help him with books or what have you. And I said, I just can't do that because all they wanted to hear was the bad stuff. Right. And I said, you don't know, need to, everybody knows the bad stuff because like Elvis did everything Jerry did, but Elvis had sense enough and listening to Tom Parker that he didn't put it on the street. Jerry didn't hide his, you know. He just was too wide open with it. But uh, Elvis was, uh, you know, Elvis was on a lot of drugs. And Jerry was too. Everybody knew about Jerry's, and nobody knew about Elvis until after he died. But just ask me a question about Jerry that you're interested in, and I'll give you the straightest answer I can. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I've listened to all of the Jerry Lee Lewis records. But uh, there's a couple that really stand out to me, and one of them that you produced, and I'm talking about Killer Country that closes yeah, with would, Over the Rainbow. It's just a great yeah, record. It is, and that's an interesting story, too. Everything in Nashville is um, through the Musicians Union, and they're all three-hour sessions. You know, 10 to 1 is the, your first in the morning, and then 2 to 5, and then 6 to 10, and, and it goes on. So we had recorded several songs, and I had about 15, 20 minutes left. Uh, I didn't want it to go to waste, and I uh, called Jerry in the control room. I said, son, we need to um, we need to do an old classic. And do um, you know any old classics? And he started naming off a couple. And he said, oh, maybe we could do Over the Rainbow. I said, you know Over the Rainbow? He said, well, sure. He had a, a encyclopedic mind full of songs from every genre almost that, that he knew, you know. Al Jolson and Hank Sr. were his favorite artists. And uh, so 
in 20 minutes, we had uh, kind of put it together and we recorded over the rainbow. And I knew it would be a hit because he, take, he took that song that Julie Garland made famous and kind of made it into his song, which he was real good at doing that. Every song he recorded, uh, he, he, did, he was not a writer, so everything was uh, uh, outside, what we called outside songs, you know, by the writers that I would gather up. But uh, he started on Over the Rainbow, and I said, oh, my God, you know. And every time he would, on that record, when he was playing the instrumental part, he would start playing something. I said, uh-oh, he painted himself in a corner. How's he going to get out of this one? And then he'd get out of it, go right in, you know, it'd be perfect. It would be perfect Jerry Lee Lewis, is what I'm saying. Hmm. And uh, it was, um, I thought it would be an interesting record to put out as a single because who would think Jerry Lee Lewis would do Open the Rainbow? And it surprised him. 39 Holden did good for him, you know. But yeah, Over the Rainbow, thank you for saying that because that's one of my favorites also. It's great. I was saying it was cut on the end of the session just just to fill out the time. Well, magical. Yep. I'm hoping you can say a few words. I'm very, I was very sorry to hear about Mickey Gilly passing. Yeah, me too. It was. Um, I say this, and I hope that you and your listeners will understand. My brother died last year. My older brother, who influenced me, uh, was a big influence on me starting a career in professional rodeo because he was a cowboy. And he was um, 12 years older than I. And Mickey's death hit me harder than my brother's. And I think the reason why is my brother came down with dementia. And he was in a home for 13 months. Nobody could see him. I couldn't see him or anything because it was right in the middle of the pandemic. He died from COVID, and my sister-in-law asked me to come down to the ranch where he had the uh, celebration of life at his uh, ranch in Texas. And I went down there and did that to officiate that. And it, I think it didn't hit me as hard losing my own brother as it did losing Mickey because I had two years to prepare for, you know, my brother didn't nurse and me has COVID. He's going to die. It breaks my heart. But after being so long, they couldn't have the celebration until a year and a half later because of the COVID deal. And, but when it was three o'clock on Friday, because Mickey and I talk, oh gosh, maybe not once a week, but several times during the month, you know, he'll call me, I'll call him. And I hadn't heard from him. And I was on my tractor out in the pasture. And his mind, he crossed my mind. I said, I hadn't talked to Mickey. So I stopped the tractor, got my phone. I sent him a text. And I said, this is Friday at 3 o'clock. I said, hey, are you okay? I haven't heard from you. And uh, didn't get an answer. That was strange. That was on Friday at 3. During the middle of the night, Saturday morning, 1.30, he died. And it was really a shock. Mm. because I knew that Mickey's health was bad, but it was from the paralysis, you know, when he broke his neck in 09. And uh, he was fought back, and he, I, I can't say he, Mickey never, you could look at Gilly and say, he's not a tough guy. Trust me, he was tough. When they moved him to uh, from Springfield, he was there in that little hospital for about a week after he broke his neck, and he was paralyzed. And they shipped him to the place called, I, I want to say, something Tierra, me and Tierra. It's a uh, physical therapy place, one of the best in the world. It's at the medical center in Houston. And where they took the lady that was shot from Arizona, the Congress lady that was shot uh, years ago, maybe she went there, so... The minute that they transferred him down to Houston, uh, my wife and I jumped in our vehicles and hightailed it from Houston, which the ranch was in Texas, so it was only a couple hundred miles. I walked in the hospital, and he was, uh, I expected him to be in bed, but he was sitting in a uh, wheelchair, and all he could move was his eyes and one finger. And he had a cell phone, one of the old flip phones was... Um, Velcro to his wheelchair and he could speed down, you know, he had one number with that one finger. 
And uh, I said, wow, I never thought I'd see my, my buddy this way. He went through so much stuff. I mean, when he got out of there, this speaks well for Mickey. He was always a sweetheart, kind-hearted guy. For two years, he couldn't work. He kept his band on the salary. He kept everybody at the theater on salary. And uh, nobody ever missed a paycheck. Wow. But he he hired uh, strength trainers. He did acupuncture, um, stem cell, um, gosh, everything he could possibly dream of. And he got where he could walk, but he could never play again because his hands looked like someone that had severe arthritis. You know how they're kind of crumpled up and when the fingers won't straighten or anything. Uh, but he put his show together and found a guy that could play exactly like him, all that make it sound like his records, you know. And he started back on the road again. And then he's always tried to help Johnny and Lee. They've been friends, and, and Johnny worked for him. Johnny was working for him before we put out Room Full of Roses in the club. And they started going out as the Urban Cowboy Tour. And he... Um, he was playing at a casino here in Oklahoma, and Liz and I, my wife, uh, went out to see him, of course. And I'm looking at that crowd. It was a packed showroom, and there were ladies out there, uh, girls, you know, girls to me, uh, in their 20s, early 30s, and they're just going nuts, you know. And so I, I don't know. I was saying, wow, all these young people, because Mickey hadn't had a short record in uh, since the late 80s. Hmm. And I said, Mickey, what are all these young people doing out here? It was backstage after the show. He said, Urban Cowboy, every time it shows, everybody watches it again, you know. <laughs> so they were, he and Johnny were going out and doing a, some really good shows as the uh, Urban Cowboy tour because Johnny was in the movie too. Right. And look, Looking for Love came out of there. And there's, there's an interesting story. Uh, when I had nothing to do with the production, by the way, on that soundtrack. But they wanted Mickey to do Looking for Love. And Mickey said, I knew it was a hit, but I wanted Johnny to have a hit. So I told him to let Johnny Lee record it. And I'll do Stand By Me, which did well for Mickey also. But he did everything to help Johnny he could. So I talked to Johnny um, the day after Mickey died. Well, the same day. Except it was the afternoon. He died on Saturday morning. I, I called Johnny about noon or one, and I said, "What happened?" And he said, "Because I've been talking to Mickey, and Mickey's told me he said I was just having a hard time walking. My back is killing me, and uh, I'm just uh, I just can't get around good anymore." Well, I heard he passed. And I said, "What happened?" And he said. He went to the doctor in Branson. They didn't know anything, so he went to Springfield, Missouri, which, by the way, if you get sick, who chooses going to Springfield, Missouri? So they found that he had uh, stomach cancer, mm -hmm. two tumors, and nobody caught it. And they gave him three months to live, and he went home and lived five days and uh, passed away. So it was it was kind of a shock, and his wife Cindy asked me, they're going to have the uh, memorial service at his theater in Branson, and she asked me yesterday if I'd come up and officiate that. So we're going to go up there, and uh, but he was really like a brother to me, because we were playing music together when I was 17, and then, of course, he was there at my wedding when I was 18, and... 64 years, I figured it out, is how long we've been close friends. Mm. So he was, the old cliche, he was like a brother to me, he really was. I loved Mickey Kelly and he loved me. It was a, a real brother relationship. Very sorry for your loss. Well, thank you very much. It's um, I had a hard two days, I really did, and my wife was kind enough because it was such a shock, and I loved him so much. He was... Uh, uh, he was a special guy. Mickey he was a hundred. Always said it, and this not taking anything away, but I will tell you now that the most talented person that I'd ever been in the studio with was Jerry D. Lewis.
he just never ever ceased to amaze me at what he would do, you know. And he was Mickey's idol too, as well as being his first cousin. Everybody knows Jerry. Oh, Jimmy Lee Swaggart, the other cousin, is coming in from Baton Rouge to uh, to preach the uh, memorial for Mickey. And I haven't seen Jimmy in 30 years. Hmm. So I'm looking forward to see him. And Jerry and Mickey and I were in the room one night talking and laughing. And Jerry did good and Mickey did good. And they were laughing about it. We think we made money. Jimmy Lee's made twice the money we made just preaching the Southern Records. <laughs> well, you know, we've touched on a few names here uh, of people that you've worked with, and it's it's really impressive. I want to read f- for the listeners out there a list, and this is not the entire list. You have credits on everyone from Marty Robbins, Luis Mandrell, Dennis Robbins, Dean Dillon, Roy Head, Billy Joe Shaver, Mickey Gilly, Bobby Borchers, the French artist Johnny Holiday. Oh, yeah, 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 Johnny Holiday. I'd forgotten about that. Is there anyone else that really comes to your mind, like just listing all those names? And that's not even all of them. There's, you know, Gary Stewart. Gary's a Wynn Stewart. Yeah, it's such a pretty world today and all that. I did not cut the original record on when I uh, had a couple of the top 10 records with him, but that wasn't one of them. This was years later. I signed it in Playboy. And when had a distinctive sound. He was, uh, his biggest fan was um, Merle, uh, Merle Haggard. Merle loved to listen to Wynn Stewart, you know. And maybe that's because when Merle got out of prison, Wynn, hired, Wynn was real big in L.A., and then he added such a pretty world today also. He hired uh, Merle to play uh, bass for him in his band right after Merle got out of prison. But he had a, he took a lot of uh, phrasing from Wynn. So, yeah, Wynn sure was fun to work with. One story on Wynn that's funny, he could not stand success. He had such a pretty world today, and then he didn't want to, he didn't want to record anymore. Then he get another hit, and then he'd lay out. Well, we had after, after the rain comes sunshine or something. I forgot. I don't remember the name of the song, but it was a top ten record. And they did an album on him, and I'd call him. He was living in L.A. I said, "Wait, I'm going to book the studio and uh, hire the players and come on up. We need to do an album." Okay, okay. And then he would call me with uh, some excuse, you know, and he couldn't make it. But he was hiding from success all his life. And then I'd book the sessions again, hire the studios, he'd call back with some excuse. But the world champion excuse he gave me is one day he called and said, Kilroy, I'm not going to be able to come up and record on those days. I said, what happened now, man? He said, well, I broke my teeth at uh, dentures. And I thought, that's, a, that's the wildest excuse I've ever heard. <laughs> but he, he was a sweet guy. He really was. And he was a talented writer. And, and he wrote a great song one time. Uh, I think Haggard recorded it also. Gosh. Now that slips from I'm sorry. I had, sometimes I have a hard time remembering all the songs. The engineers that I used regularly uh, in mid-80s, and I was still recording a lot then, they, just for fun, they went through all the the vaults and everything and all the things that we'd done. And, and they said, Kilroy, well, you know, you produced over 3,000 songs. I said, really? It didn't seem like it. And then there was probably uh, a few more. Maybe they didn't count because I was I was still cutting when they did that. But So sometimes I forget the songs. I apologize. There were just so many. Well, let me ask you this, Kilroy. Of all the things you've done, uh, music, radio, Rodeo, is there something you're most proud of? Well, of course, I'm proud of the awards. I'll be one from the, um, you know, the producer of the year awards. And of course, I'm happy with those. But I think that the biggest kick that I ever had in my whole life was taking that Channel 13, which was originally Hank's Place on Exit Satellite Radio, and taking traditional country music, which I love so much, and beat every music channel out of 68. And I'm thinking, 
That really pleases me because the CEO of XM, of course, he would go to New York with his New York buddies, you know, and he got to ring the bell at the stock exchange and so forth. And they would say, what is your favorite channel? What's your biggest channel on XM? And he would love to have said, oh, it's the jazz channel or it's our uh, classic rock channel or da, 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 da. And he'd have to be kind of, well, it's that, uh, it's that channel that plays that old country music. Oh, he hated that. Oh, God. <laughs> because, you know, it was, uh, I got a kick out of that. I got a kick out of, of us pinning, uh, the ears back on all the other channels, you know. But then it changed because, oh, you know, this is cute because you know about editing and so forth. And Willie and I have been pals since the early 60s. And, they had a thing going, both of them, Sirius and XM, that was when, you know, that was before the merger, about who had the most artist favor, you know, and they had an artist family. And Willie's bus was in the um, parking lot there at, uh, in Washington, D.C., where XM was. And I'd been out talking to him, and he would like to have had his own channel. And a few days later, somebody said, how do uh, we really need Willie Nelson? But God, we don't want to have enough bandwidth for another channel. He can't have his own channel. We can't give it to him. We'd love to. I said, Yeah, we can. Yeah, he's got his own channel now. If you want it, how are you going to do it? I said, you Give my people forty-eight hours in uh, production. We'll flip it from Hank's place to Willie's place. They, you can. They say you can do that. I said, well, yeah. So that, that's how it became Willie's Place, which was my way of getting a ticket to leave. Uh, we were having to live in Northern Virginia. Nobody lives in Washington, D.C. except 225 people at night. Everybody lives in uh, Maryland or Virginia. We, we live 50 miles out in uh, Virginia, so we have enough room for our horses. But uh, anyway, that that was my ticket to get back to Texas, and Willie was building a big truck stop down there in the facility. So they kept dragging on and dragging on the building of it, you know. So I called Will. I said, Willie, call him and tell him that um, that you need me down there now. And he did. And nobody can say no to Willie Nelson, not because of who he is, but because he's too darn nice. And uh, they said, okay, so they built that studio uh, in my home there at the ranch until the other studio was built uh, over at Willie's place, which was about five miles away. And then I had to get up every morning and drive five miles to work. But it was, uh, that, I guess that was one of my biggest thrills. It was, you know, everyone, everything I was so blessed with. Every time a record would go number one, of course, I was happy. Of course, I was and then I had, I loved to have the battle because I had little Playboy records, you know, with a staff of five going a gush case to uh, RCA and uh, Columbia and all the major labels, which had anywhere from 200 to 300 people scattered around the country and, and working in Nashville. And then my little uh, operation over there, Jerry Bradley was a good friend of mine. He was president of uh, RCA in Nashville. And when Charlie Pride had a record out that was kind of close to Gillies, you know, I'd always pick up the phone and call Jerry. Hey, you can't be number one this week with Charlie because Gillies got it. And I used to rub it in a lot, you know, because they didn't take Playboy seriously when we first opened there. I mean, hmm. because first of all, it was kind of a bizarre step. Playboy is going to go into country music, you know. And they did. They had some pop records out in California, but they were never hits, you know. Well, they did have one on a group I didn't understand either because it was rock. Hamilton, Joe, Frank, and Reynolds was the only hit that they ever had put on, uh, out of the L.A. office. So, yeah, that was always, we had a lot of fun. But Nashville was different then. It was uh, it was like a big family. Everybody knew each other. And, you know, you could go down to 16th Avenue and somebody popped their head out and say, Hey, man, I love that new record you got out on Gilly. It's blah, blah, you know, where to go. And then it turned into a deal where they were really thinking, oh, that lucky son of a gun, you know, da da da. <laughs> and I hated the BMI celebrations and parties that I had to go to because there were people in there that were always jealous of somebody, not necessarily me. 
that somebody and everybody's patting themselves on, oh, I love you, love you, I hadn't seen you in four or five days, oh, I love you. And then when they'd walk off, they'd say, I don't even like that SOB, you know. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is much too pony for me. And I'm just a range guy from Texas. <laughs> but it, uh, it was a it was a heck of a ride in Nashville and at XM Satellite Radio, and I'm uh, I still have contact with no direct involvement anymore. I'm not uh, announcing rodeos, uh, but I still stay in touch with a lot of my cowboy friends. What would you say to anybody who's listening in? Now this is just totally totally open ended. Sure. Just to give you the stage. That are in country music today. Or or just anyone who who just happened to be listening in. If they're interested in doing music and they're interested, no matter what the genre is, and they really want to do it, when they fail, try again. Never try Because eventually, if your passion is there, it will surface. If it's a great song, I equate it to cream because cream always rises to the top. Hmm. And if it's a great song, it'll rise there. It'll kind of do it on its own once you can get it recorded. You never get it matched with the right people because it has to appeal to the people in something that the minute they hear it, they feel it, you know, they like it. And I always went to, my the theory is I chose songs. If I listen to a song where I was supposed to be trained to do that, and I could not hum the melody. Then I figured the guy that was working in the mechanic shop listening on the radio or anyone else, if I couldn't hum the melody, they probably couldn't either. So to me, the melody was always the most important thing because the melody would get them and then they would start listening to the lyrics. But their attention was first caught by the by the melody. But anybody that's writing right now are pursuing a career as a recording artist and singer. They just have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And there's so many examples. You know, Toby Keith. Uh, matter of fact, I have uh, dinner Friday night. Uh, it's uh, the guy that gave him his first record deal, Harold Shedd, who produced a lot of hits up there. Oh, he had yeah. gone over to Mercury. And Harold's coming in from, uh, he sold out, retired, and went back to his home in a little town in Georgia. And he called me and said, I'm going to be doing some traveling. I may come to Oklahoma City and see you. That was last year. And I said, that would be a thrill, Harold, because we were in, uh, we went to radio engineering school together in 1958. Wow. And we buddied up there, and then we both ended up in Nashville. And he's been a really close friend ever since. He had so, so much success with Alabama. But he gave uh, Toby Keith his first record deal on Mercury. He, he started Toby. Matter of fact, he said, I may call Toby to have dinner with us. I said, that'd be great. <laughs> so uh, he only lives 20 miles from here. He lives in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And he's um, he never moved to Nashville and. uh that was smart. I advised Gilly never to move because, you know, you go to Nashville and you see Johnny Cash walking down the street or anybody. Oh, there's old Johnny, you know, no big deal. I see him all the time. But uh, I asked Mickey not to move, and he didn't, really didn't want to move anyway. And he didn't move to Nashville, so consequently, when he would come in, there would be a buzz on the street like, hey, man, Gilly's in town, Gilly's in town. He, they just, it was not someone they saw every day. Well, I say that to bring up Toby Keith. He'd be in the same situation because he didn't move to Nashville. So nobody's paying that much attention to him because they're not going to see him every day. But when he does get there, it's, oh, my God, Toby Keith's here. Let's go uh, see him or something, you know. I'm, I'm talking about industry people. Right. So, so um, yeah, um, I think people need to persevere because there's a lot of discouragement. Right. You know, I could have gone back to... Uh, the day when Aaron told me that my songs were not worth anything. And I said, well, I'll just give it another shot, you know. And I went back up there. I think Toby went three or four times before he ever got a record deal. Hmm. As for Harold Shedd, he, it's a small world because it was just about ex almost exactly two months ago that he was on the show. 
Really? Very nice man. Oh, yeah. Always wonderful. Wonderful. Great guy. Very sweet. One of, one of my dearest, dearest, lifelong, literally lifelong friends. One that I could pick up the phone and call if I was out of fuel at 3 o'clock in the morning on the interstate. He'd say, I'll be there in a little bit. <laughs> you know, and he could do the same with me, you know. And those are real friends. Well, I hope he remembers, but when you uh, when you, when you you sit down and, and have lunch with him, tell him I said hello. Well, I certainly will, for sure. And, hey, man, it's been great visiting with you, and uh, um, know that your listeners are really enjoying what you're putting in them. And as long as you feed them good music, you'll have them. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, Mr. Kilroy, thank you. Well, hey, you be blessed and uh, have a wonderful time with your show and let it grow and grow and grow and uh, you grow with it. And, hey, man, have a great life. Thank you. And you, too. Thanks so much for having me as visit with you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for stopping by today. If you enjoyed our program, consider telling a friend about it. The Paul Leslie Hour is made possible through people just like you. So you want to keep the show going, right? Go to thepaulleslie.com. That's thepaulleslie.com. Click on Support the Show. And thanks to everyone who contributes. Performance of the intro music is courtesy of John Primerano, the entertainer, written by Scott Joplin. End credit theme music is courtesy of John Primerano, the traditional song, Corina, Corina. Your announcer is Dan Gold. Hey, that's me. The show is hosted and produced by Paul Leslie. And we'll see you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour. <laughs>